Yes, we're back with another episode of EMK's Best Case Ever mini podcast series. I'm your host, Dr. Rajiv Thavanathan. We're here with a very special guest, and I always say they're special guests, but this one is totally, definitely a very special guest. His name is Dr. Shabazz Syed. He is a staff physician at the Ottawa Hospital with a fellowship in digital scholarship and special interests in rational resource utilization. He also manages the EM Ottawa blog, and you might know him as an editor and contributor at Canadium, which is a great site with resources for learners at all levels that includes not just residents, but medical students and staff physicians too. There's tons of great phone med and editorial content on there. Shabazz, thanks for being with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me here in your kitchen, and that was quite the introduction. Yeah, it's weird hearing hearing all the great things that you do listed in one sentence. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, for me, it's like he likes sandwiches, and he like I think he listens to music. That's about it. <laughs> Fair enough. So Shabazz is here today to tell us about his best case ever. Shabazz, why don't you take it away? An 86-year-old female is brought into the emergency department with chest pain. She states that the chest pain radiates towards her back. She's otherwise healthy, has a history of hypertension for which she takes hydrochlorothiazide, but she's functionally independent, drives her own car, lives alone. She's a great 86-year-old. She's as healthy as an 82-year-old. She looked like a 78-year-old. Okay. She's noted to be hypertensive in the emergency department. So at this point, Rajiv, what are you wondering? Well, you know, she's got a couple of vascular risk factors, so ACS, you know, until otherwise ruled out. But that story you're giving me about hypertension and it's radiating to her back? That sounds like one of the big baddies that we don't want to miss. Mm-hmm. So what would you do next, assuming her ECG is normal, let's say? So non-specific ECG and we still need to rule out dissection? Mm. That person's probably going to get a CAT scan, I think, in my department. Okay. So CT scan's done. Again, looking for dissection, just like you thought. The radiology resident calls you over and says she's got a type B aortic dissection. Okay, wow. So that's a, a great pickup. Yeah. So what are you going to do now? So type B dissection can probably be medically managed, but you definitely want to get you know the heart rate down, blood pressure down, sort of minimize those shear forces in the aorta, consult vascular, get her admitted probably to ICU. Yeah. So that's exactly what happened for this patient. And then you high five yourself, right? Another life saved. Great diagnosis made. Yeah, I just, I feel like there's like a twist coming somewhere here. I feel like I'm hanging out with M. Night Shyamalan. (laughs) I wish I had that kind of storytelling prowess. But what actually ended up happening, so she did go to the ICU. She was started on the labetalol infusion. Unfortunately, she developed an acute kidney injury from the labetalol, and she ended up actually needing dialysis. After she was on dialysis, she got, you know, multi-organ dysfunction, and she actually died as a result of her injuries. Oh. What's... Kind of concerning about this story, not to be a big bummer, but about 12 hours in, the next morning, the staff radiologist always reads the scans from overnight, and he said there was actually no dissection. The CAT scan was totally pristine. Huh. So, Rajiv, what would you say, like, if this was an M&M case, what would you say, what would be some of the major highlights? Well, you know, the biggest, I guess, error in the case seems to be that misinterpretation of the chest CT and then acting on it and then starting someone down that sort of like diagnostic or therapeutic pathway. Exactly. And that's what most people think when they hear their stories. They say, okay, well, the radiology resident made a mistake, and that's what, you know, led to this series of events. I would actually pause people and maybe consider it in a different light in that, you know what, forget the fact that the radiology resident misinterpreted that CT, and think of this more as a false positive test result. Because we get false positives all the time in terms of all of our test ordering, and we often fail to consider them because we do something rather disingenuous when it comes to tests is we treat them as gospel. We treat them as all tests are right all the time. And the problem and the reason I think this is such an important case is because in medicine, we've started to use tests almost as a surrogate for doctoring. And so failing to appreciate that there are false positives, we can do a lot of harm to people. And that's really what I want to talk about here today. So that goes beyond just diagnostic imaging. This could be the troponin, this could be the D-dimer, this is like applies to a lot of stuff that we do, exactly. really. Exactly. Anything we over-test, any place we over-treat, prescriptions, imaging, blood work, etc. And I think this case really opens up that Pandora box of all the harms we do to patients. I mean, right there in the Hippocratic Oath is the phrase, do no harm. And yet, in our pursuit of sort of diagnosing and treating everything, we often seem to live, leave this part in our dust. And there's plenty of evidence that we do too many tests, investigations, procedures, and treatments. And the vast majority of this overutilization, unfortunately, has very little yield in terms of helping patients. And it often results in more harm than good. And so there's one big assumption we need to make here. And that assumption is that we do too much stuff. 
And there's lots and lots of evidence to support this, but we certainly do too many things diagnostically, too many things in terms of treating patients, and that oftentimes this stuff does not help patients at all. Okay, I can definitely join you in at that starting point of we do too much. Okay, so that's drinking the Kool-Aid 101. Okay, sure. The first thing I really want to talk about in terms of, so we can jump to the meat of this talk and so that you can drink some more of my Kool-Aid here, is that we need to talk about Bayesian theory. It's a hard concept, and to be honest, it took me years and years to try and really understand it, and the simplest way I can think of it is this. In any case presentation, you have a pretest probability of a disease being present based on the information you have, and testing should change that probability. So when we think about Bayesian theory, there's two main components. So the first is that the probability of an event occurring is based on conditions that might be related to that event. So for example, 21-year-old male with chest pain is very unlikely to have coronary artery disease. Whereas a 76-year-old vasculopathic, hypertensive, diabetic, cocaine-using male is very likely to have coronary artery disease. The second thing is that tests have false positives and false negatives. So a test does not tell you if a disease is present or absent. A test merely adjusts your probability that a disease may or may not be there. And in Bayesian theory, this context is the most important thing to think about because without context, the results of a test have no meaning. They have no intrinsic truth whatsoever. So for example, when someone hands you an ECG at triage, from triage, and you see some ST elevation on it, what's the first question you ask? I usually say, you know, uh, is the person having chest pain? Exactly. And that's your context. That without that context, the results of a test have zero meaning. So that's Bayesian theory in a nutshell. And that's something that we kind of need to explain and get out of the way. So the idea is that tests need context. And that the test isn't a black and white therapeutic decision point, but that it just adjusts that probability. Yeah, that's great. Now, the reason this is all super important is because we do a lot of harm to patients. Sometimes these harms are very visible in front of us. You know, somebody passes away as a result of something we do. And sometimes these are subtle and invisible to physicians, but certainly still causing harm to patients. So I want to touch on some of these. So the first one is we think, or at least we like to think that we're well knowledgeable about the radiation risks to patients when we undergo CAT scan imaging. Right. Because, you know, when we have the young 20 year old woman, you know, we're not going to send her off for a CTP the way, same way we would send off like a seven year old man. Exactly. So let me pose this to you. You know where Chernobyl is, right? Yeah, it's uh, Russia, right? Or it's one of the Baltic states or something, right? Like, yeah, in Russia. So there's a big nuclear disaster there. Let's say you, there's a famous picture of a Ferris wheel. Would you be willing to spend an hour by the Ferris wheel? We'll give you a bottle of vodka to pass the time, but you have to hang out there for an hour. At like ground zero of Chernobyl? Like, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. No, I wouldn't do it. No. no, Nobody would. I mean, this is like based on 2010 data, so it's not as bad anymore, but you get about six millisieverts an hour being around there. Okay. A CT scan of the chest, plain CT, is 7 millisieverts. CTPE is about 15 millisieverts. So we're not willing to spend any time at Chernobyl, and I mean, I wouldn't want to either, right. but we have no problems doing CAT scans on patients. But it's so tough not to. I mean, I totally agree with you, but it's tough. Why do you think it is that we, as physicians, struggle with or underestimate the risks of radiation exposure? It's a good question, and I think there's ultimately two reasons. The first is it doesn't affect us. So me missing a diagnosis affects me right now. Me giving someone potentially cancer 30 years from now has zero impact on me. The second is because I have no idea how to interpret this data. So I could say, yes, you have a one in 300 chance of getting cancer maybe 30 years from now, depending on what you're exposed to. It's impossible to interpret that data. I think the important point to bring up here is that radiation risk is real. We need to be cognizant of it and that we need to explain it to our patients. I think that's totally fair. And if our listeners want a different resource to check out so you can be a little bit more savvy about canceling your patients, check out xrayrisk.com. You can basically plug in whatever imaging you would do to your patient and it can give you in millisieverts how much it is or in a expected increase in cancer over their lifetime, which might be like a more practical number to tell your patients. So another one I want to talk about is false positives and negatives. So this is an area that we could do a lot of harm to patients and we're going to use the CT dissection as that example. So instead of thinking, you know, there was a medical error there, we could think that, well, it was a false positive test result that led to harm. Because we know that about a third of all tests done to patients contribute nothing in terms of aiding in sort of their diagnostic workup. And we also know that if you took a healthy individual and did 10 tests, so a CBC, for example, 
about a 40% chance that one of those tests is going to be positive. And so the false positives are dangerous because you can lead down this sort of diagnostic cascade, just like Our Lady with the aortic dissection. And you can do a lot of harm to people. And I think it's just, we don't think about it. We don't appreciate it. And the more testing we do, the more likely we are to have more false positives. And so the best way to minimize the harm that someone gets as a result of false positives is to just not do those tests. Right. So maybe more judicious use of the test to begin with. Exactly. Another one that goes hand in hand with this is the erroneous diagnosis or the incidental finding, incidentaloma. We find erroneous things all the time. And sometimes physicians and patients say, well, maybe we're just better off to find something. But the literature doesn't support that at all. So a meta-analysis showed about 30% of all CAT scans have an incidental finding of some kind. Now, some people would say, great, we found something, we can fix it. But only about a 1% of patients derived a benefit from finding whatever that incidental finding was. 5% of patients underwent harm, and 05 underwent significant harm in terms of morbidity or mortality. Right. Especially, you know, if we're seeing, you know, a couple of thousand people a year, you know, that rate that you're talking about, that 0.3 to 0.5%, like that starts to add up over like the course of someone's career, for example. Exactly. But one of the big harms that we do to the department is we often are one of the culprits in overcrowding. And so we often try to downgrade people off monitors and they end up in the observation area. Monitors are our most precious resource. Now, if you're doing unnecessary testing on patients in acute areas, or even in patients in sort of subacute areas, you're going to fill those areas up, patients are going to be there for longer, and you're going to end up just downgrading people to various parts of the department. And your department essentially just fills up slowly. And I think we all know that a full department is not always a good department. In fact, it can be a dangerous, bad department. Okay, what else do you got? Another one, and we're going to only do a one-liner on this one, is cost, because physicians do not care about cost. But in the U.S., they waste about $750 billion annually. In Canada, it's somewhere around 32 to $86 billion. $40 billion a year. In Canada, yeah. In wasted, wasteful testing. Yeah. That is too much money. That is too much money. And I know physicians don't tend to care that much about cost, but in our current geopolitical climate, I think we have to at least be aware of it. Yeah, no, for sure, man. And when I hear a number like $40 billion, I'm definitely paying attention. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of harms that we do to people. So, Rajiv, you're a resident here at the Ottawa Hospital and the University of Ottawa. You're a senior resident. You're a very good senior resident. So, you know... Well, thank you for saying that. (laughs) We're going to make sure we send this to your program director. (laughs) There's lots of areas where there's strong evidence for stuff. And I know you know that stuff. There's also areas where there's no evidence for stuff. And so we don't do things. And I know you know those. There's a lot of gray area in medicine. And so how do you approach the gray areas that there are in medicine? Like how to develop a practice pattern? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess I guess the short of it is I'll, I'll pull maybe every staff, every person, senior, and sometimes junior media that I can find, sometimes even outside my specialty, I'll ask a cardiologist, what do you do with this chest pain? And then I'll just kind of average it and figure out how it sort of fits on my spectrum of practice. But, you know, working in an academic center, I'm still a learner. There's supervisors of all different you know types of different training streams, of, sometimes from different countries, from different health systems, and everyone's kind of got a, a unique perspective on it. So I just kind of, like I said, I just try to... Like, Average all that and figure out, well, how does this make sense to me? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I knew the answer to that question because we worked a night shift the other day. And uh, so those of you listening, Rajiv would ask me, you know, what would you do for this case? And I would tell him what I would do. And he goes, great, that's cool to know. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something else. But um, (laughs) right, (laughs) I don't know, disrespect to you or any people who tells me, but it's like, you know, how does this fit with my approach to medicine? Exactly. And there's actually evidence to support that, you know, the strongest predictor of how you practice is how you are taught. So that makes sense, right? Is you're taking all that gray area in medicine, figuring out what people do, where there's kind of variation, and using that to dictate your practice. And so we can do a lot of harm to the healthcare system in terms of our learners if we practice a culture of overutilization. So I had a, a med student once tell me that they believed every chest pain patient needed a chest x-ray. Now, that's simply not true, but someone taught them that. And Medicine has this culture of, you know, see one, do one, teach one. Or as it's now, YouTube one, do one, teach one. Yeah, right. And then you have to make sure that you do it in a room that the patients can't see you. Exactly. How do I put in a pigtail cavity? <laughs> exactly. But what happens then is you imprint upon them and they believe that thing to be true. So if you don't teach learners to question the utility of anything and everything, they're going to start thinking that, you know, whatever a physician teaches them is dogma. And where we can get into trouble is when we take our dogma and we teach it to a learner as an absolute and they believe it's an absolute. So when you say, you know what, this is how we should do this thing, you kind of have to provide that caveat. So for example, I am cognizant of the fact that I over-investigate in trauma. 
It's one of my biases and it's where I tend to overinvestigate and I'm okay with that. But I always give that caveat to my learners that I say, yeah, you know what? You don't have to do that pelvic x-ray, but we're doing it because I want to. But that's my dogma based on no evidence. And so when you work with a lot of learners or any learner at all, I think it's really important to tell them what your dogma is and what your way of doing is so that they don't think that's how you do things because that will lead to a culture of over-investigating. Right. So just it's not necessarily... uh inviting healthy skepticism all the time, but at least being upfront with, you know, what the evidence base for what you're doing actually is. Exactly. So Shabazz, from everything you've been telling us, it seems like there's tons of evidence that we over-investigate. What is it? What makes physicians do this? So it's a very good question. And there's a lot of various things physicians do, and we'll get into some of the biggest ones. And because I know there's a lot of Americans listening, we're first going to touch on medical legal fears. Now, from an American perspective, there's been some states that have initiated tort reform. And I think you were saying that MRAP talked about this in a recent edition. Yeah, I think there was like a paper chase about it like a little while ago. And so what that showed as well as some of the other evidence out there is that in states with tort reform, that resource utilization has not gone down, which suggests that it's a pretty soft talking point for why people over-investigate. And to be honest, I think it's a bit of a scapegoat that people say, yeah, I'm ordering more tests to protect my butt. But I actually think there's more complicated sort of psychological reasons for why we over-investigate. So what are some of those? If it's not, I'm worried about getting sued, like, why do you think we do this? So I think the biggest one is diagnostic uncertainty. So a low tolerance to diagnostic uncertainty is a significant factor for over-investigating. And intuitively, I think we can rationalize where this comes from. In medicine, we're trained to seek out and diagnose disease. So it's inherent within us to come up with a diagnosis. And when uncertainty exists, it makes us uncomfortable. To attempt to achieve diagnostic certainty, it seems MDs have gone to increased testing, despite the fact that there's no evidence to show that increased testing leads to better outcomes for patients. And sometimes disease does just need to evolve and declare itself. The caveat to this is you need to get rid of hostile bounce back culture in order for this to be acceptable. You can't sort of, when patients come back to the emergency department, it should be good. You came back, you did what you were supposed to, not, oh, you know, Dr. So-and-so missed this. Well, you know, one of my mentors, who's a uh, rural family doc in the, the town of Porto Basque, Newfoundland, so shout out to Dr. Dave Thomas if he's listening. But he always said that it's like, you know, looking at something on the vine and trying to identify what kind of vegetable it is. You know, the consultants and people on the third visit can look at saying, like, clearly this is a pumpkin. It's huge and orange and has ridges. But you always forget that, you know, initially when it showed up, like, it looked, was just like a little small green nubbin. Like, you had no idea if that was a pumpkin or a green pepper or what it was going to be. And sometimes... I will actually use this analogy when I talk to patients, like things just require a little bit of time to evolve. That is a perfect example from Newfoundland. Yeah. Although I don't think they actually grow pumpkins on the West Coast of Newfoundland. So I don't think that's (laughs) as perfect an analogy as you might want it to be. Something that kind of goes hand in hand with diagnostic uncertainty is risk tolerance. So there's been a series of studies done where they did validated personality tests on physicians. And these were done to determine what their risk aversity was. And they found that physicians with poor risk tolerance ordered statistically more tests on patients than their colleagues did. They admitted statistically more patients than their colleagues did. And yet, despite this, they had no difference in outcomes with no increased diagnoses made. The next thing that also goes hand in hand with risk tolerance is the fear of missing a diagnosis. So this one kind of fits with diagnostic uncertainty and risk tolerance. But what this study did is they had patients or they had physicians, sorry, qualify why they were doing a CTPE. And not surprisingly, having a high pretest probability for a PE was correlated with finding a PE. But they found when the physician qualified that they were afraid of missing a PE was actually negatively associated with finding a PE. I think these are the big three reasons why we over-investigate. Diagnostic uncertainty, risk tolerance, and the fear of missing a diagnosis. And it brings me to the sort of one, if there's one big take-home that I wanted everyone to learn from today, or if there's one thing that I want everyone to incorporate into their practice, it's before you do anything, whether it's a test or a procedure or a treatment, think, am I doing this for the benefit of my patient? Or am I doing it to make myself feel better? Because if you're doing it to make yourself feel better, it's probably something that you shouldn't be doing, or at the very least should be talking to your patient about. Shabazz has touched on a lot of concrete ways that we can improve our resource utilization without sacrificing patient care or satisfaction. That underlying assumption of we do too much, I think, is an important take home. And so is the concept that there's a lot of extra baggage that comes with increased testing, financial costs, radiation risks, other harms to patients like patient anxiety. And none of this is even improving our diagnostic hit rate. I think it's fair to say getting comfortable with the idea of risk tolerance is paramount to how we practice good emergency medicine. 
When we're imparting knowledge onto others, whether students, residents, or other physician colleagues or people in allied health like RTs, nurses, paramedics, we also have to be aware that how we learn is how we practice. And we can't underestimate how powerful imprinting can be, especially when it comes to teaching our personal practice as if it's dogma. So Shabazz, thanks so much for coming in and talking to me today. This was an awesome experience and always fun to chat with you. Do you have anything else like maybe that you want to just tell learners, like resources that they can look up or places to go for some of the subtleties of these discussions? So I've written a lot on this sort of stuff or on Canadian. So that's Canadian with an E-M on the end, dot org in the editorial section. So I've written a lot of my sort of thoughts and reflections on some of these things, especially rational resource utilization. And then I'm always happy to chat with people. You can find me on Twitter at ddxdino. And I'm happy to have discussions about this type of stuff. And well, I guess that's it for another episode of Best Case Ever for EM Cases. I'm Rajiv Thavanathan. You can follow me on Twitter at at Rajiv Thava. That's R-A-J-I-V-T-H-A-V-A. Until next time, keep your stick on the ice. Bye.